Welcome once again to this online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. As we launch into this Pentecost season, we see the effects of the Holy Spirit touching people's hearts as he sends out his word, choosing people to do that. May God bless us today as we consider his choosing of us. Let's begin today by singing the hymn, Come Unto Me, Ye Weary. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
we join in the prayer of the day. Almighty and merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to seek and to save the lost. Graciously open our ears and our hearts to hear his call and follow him by faith, that we may feast with him forever in his kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're using as an overarching theme for this service that God calls not the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And it's a reminder to us that it's Jesus and his grace which allows us to serve in God's kingdom and to follow him. We see beautiful examples of that in today's scripture readings. Our first from the book of Exodus chapter 3, as the Lord calls Moses to be the liberator of his people Israel. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over there and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. The Word of the Lord. We turn to our, also our second reading this day from 1 Timothy chapter 1, words that will be the focus for today's sermon. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, 
Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example to those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. We acclaim today's gospel. Alleluia. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Hallelujah. Today's Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. Our hymn of the day is Chief of Sinners Though I Be. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. When was the last time you heard someone brag about being number two? Hey, we were voted the number two restaurant in town. I'm the number two Brewers fan out there. I'm the number two dad in the eyes of my kids. 
There's a huge step down from being number one to calling yourself number two. But who can really call themselves number one, honestly? If my grandchildren are listening, I may one day get a shirt that says, Number One Papa, and I will be flattered. But I'm guessing there are other Papas out there who deserve it more. Your team may win a weekend tournament, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're the best team anywhere. It's a bit pompous boasting that you're number one in anything, unless you're listening to St. Paul today. You may find yourself nodding your head in agreement that you, like him, are certainly number one. But it won't probably be the way most people suppose. What do you imagine most people would think if they heard someone like you, a believer in Jesus Christ, vocal about your faith, say, I'm number one? Wouldn't their immediate reaction be, oh, they're so full of themselves? They think they're better than anyone else. Let's face it, sometimes Christians do come across that way. And if that's the way we act toward others, that we are more moral, more righteous, more worthy of a heavenly reward of golden streets and pearly gates than anyone else, we give Jesus quite a black eye. Still, you can say, I'm number one just as our spiritual brother St. Paul did to his young pastor friend, Timothy. Let's see what he meant as he begins by saying today, yes, I've sinned worse than anyone else. I'm the number one sinner. Paul is instructing young man Timothy about being a pastor of people's souls. And right off the bat, he warns him against false teachers, full of themselves, who don't begin to understand the, the mercy of God towards sinners. He contrasts their fake preaching with his and begins, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. The one we call St. Paul used to be called Saul of Tar Tarsus, but he's not the man he used to be. He marvels at the way God blessed him with strength and trust and an opportunity to serve him. But this honor had nothing to do with merit or performance. Just the opposite. He confesses, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I don't think you or I would have liked Saul of Tarsus had we met him back in the day. He was a bad human being. But it wouldn't be because of the typical things that make men bad. He wasn't, for example, a womanizer or a drug addict or an alcoholic. He didn't abuse children or incite riots or rob the poor. He didn't cheat on his taxes or steal retirement funds through Bernie Madoff Ponzi schemes. In fact, in many ways, people considered him super pious, hyper-religious, and devout. He was a Jewish Pharisee, counted among the most zealous of Israel's leaders. But have you noticed that sometimes it's the hyper-religious that have the biggest problem with God and humanity? That was his issue. Note how he describes himself. First, a blasphemer one who was slandering the name of God without even realizing he was doing it by rejecting Jesus, God's Son. He was a persecutor, one who made life miserable for all those who did confess faith in Jesus Christ. And he calls himself a violent man, one who was prone to brutality, who had no problem making people suffer, almost like a mafia bully who seemed to have no conscience. When he stood before King Agrippa, he confessed his previous state of mind this way. I too, he said, was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme. 
I was so obsessed, he said, with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. He was an educated, brutal fool, studying the scriptures like a scholar, but utterly ignorant of the salvation they pointed to in God's Son. In a way, Paul might agree that he was number one. He was the world's number one most arrogant, most perverse, most vigorous enemy of God and man. That's nothing to brag about. It's like saying you're the biggest spiritual idiot in the world. But it was vital to his spiritual salvation that he finally came to realize the truth about himself. It's where spiritual hope always and only must begin. It took the vision of Jesus, appearing to him on the road to his, to his evil plans in Damascus, Syria, causing him to stumble to the ground with his divine anger, charging him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Only after a blistering period of self-evaluation could God raise him up in baptism to have hope, to have life. At times, you know, your computer has to be rebooted in order to function well. The same principle can apply to real spiritual life. It doesn't take long for the virus of sin and the distractions of life in this sinful world to begin to so envelop our minds and hearts that we lose sight of love for God and love for mankind. We are mucked up. We forget why we're here. There comes a time when we must go through a spiritual reboot. We must come to confess to God, I am the worst idol worshiper. I am the most deceiving liar. I am the most selfish human being. I am the biggest cheat, the worst adulterer, the laziest lout, the most judgmental hypocrite, the most needy addict, the biggest parasite on humanity, the most brutal abuser, the greatest blasphemer of God's name. As we confess our sins and receive forgiveness, God's grace allows us to reboot our lives and begin new every morning, as Jeremiah said. That's what Saul needed. That's what you need, too. It begins by admitting that you are the only and worst sinner in the world. You're number one. But if that's the only spiritual conviction you've come to, that you're the worst sinner in the world, it's a recipe for despair, not salvation. No, true spirituality, true godliness, demands you must also grasp another way in which you are number one. You must learn to say, yes, I've been shown mercy than anyone else. I am number one. Saul of Tarsus soon became Paul the Apostle, sent out by Jesus Christ to preach good news to sinners all over the Roman Empire. How did that happen? Listen as he reflects on the story of God's love. The grace of our Lord, he said, was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul discovered. God's grace, his undeserved favor, was poured out on me, he said, abundantly, a super overflowing from the reservoir of God's immense love for sinners. Not only that, he poured out faith where there was only unbelief and love for God and man where there had only been pride and anger and self-consumed bullying before. How did that come about? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. It was all about Jesus Christ. He didn't come to the world to scold it, to reform it, or to condemn it. He came into the world to save it from God's wrath, from fear of punishment, from an eternal separation from Almighty God. He came to reveal the heart of a loving, merciful God by laying down his pure, holy life in place of our dirty lives. He made the most profound value exchange that could ever be made, the innocent for the guilty, our hell for his heaven, a divine relationship in place of eternal alienation. He came to give this hopeless world the best kind of hope, eternal, heavenly hope. And who is this for? 
For me, he said, the number one sinner in the world. There was a special reason why Paul talked this way, so boldly, so openly. He said, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. If God can show mercy to a terrible sinner like me, Paul explained, it ought to give hope to everyone else out there. Paul loved to boast about how needy he was so that people might begin to grasp how generous God is. Imagine some guy or gal dressed in nice clothes, clearly healthy, well-fed, well-dressed, and cheerful, going to all the beggars and street people downtown and spreading the message, you know what? I was poorer and more miserable than you. I was the number one street person in the world. But there's this guy over there, immensely rich, that gave away wealth to me and set me on a new path. And guess what? He's still there. And he's still giving away his wealth freely to all who know they are poor and broken. Can you imagine how fast some would run to find this guy? Let me close with an observation that comes from the world of prison. The stories are legion about those who, after ruining their lives through selfishness, drugs, and a life of crime, and reaching the bottom of the pit, come to hear about Jesus in prison and believe in him. There are those who are skeptical of such prison conversions, of course, as if it's all fake. Of course they start believing in Jesus, they say. It makes them look good to the judge and parole board. It's all a con, con game. I suppose some might be playing a game. But I say, what better place to come to believe in a Savior from sin? Their entire existence behind bars reminds them they are failures to themselves, to their families, to their community, and ultimately to their God. What better candidate for salvation is there than one who is convinced that she or he is the number one sinner in the world who has been loved and shown mercy by the number one Savior in the world? Friend, now let it become personal. You may be guilty of an action in your life that haunts you. Your conscience torments you. You wish you could take it back. You wish you could start all over but you can't. Maybe you've punished yourself in a prison of your own making, a prison of guilt, a prison of self-loathing, a prison of hopelessness and gloom. Friend, that's not the way. Our brother, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, shows us the right way to deal with all his regrets. Be the number one sinner in the world. Gladly embrace your sin, because if you are not a wicked sinner, the number one criminal, Christ can have nothing to do with you. But then, be the number one object of God's mercy because that's what Jesus has made you. And allow his love to lift you up out of your dungeon and into the home of freedom and eternal life. That trust is the highest honor and the grandest praise you will ever sing to your Savior. Be number one. How better can we respond than with the words of St. Paul himself as he closes, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, merciful Heavenly Father, you have blessed us, dear Lord, in calling us into your kingdom, though we do not deserve it. Yet you have chosen sinners to be your children, dear Lord, as you did with Moses and St. Paul and Thomas. We ask, dear Lord, that you would continue to bless all of us as we follow you, that you would strengthen our faith in you, and that you would use us mercifully in your kingdom to share the word of salvation with a word that world that desperately needs to know you. Lord, be with us and bless our church in its mission. In the name of Jesus, who has also taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Let's join in singing the hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. We're so glad that you spent this hour with us around God's word and his promises and pray that it's a great blessing to your faith. Thank you also for sharing the services with others and for supporting this ministry financially. It's a big help. Let's take a moment to watch this month's edition of The Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Our Synod has adopted the goal of planting 100 new home missions 
and enhancing 75 existing missions in the next 10 years. That effort has already begun. And these new missions are planning their ministries to create opportunities to tell their neighbors about Jesus. Here's one example of a church that's beginning to do just that in Durham, North Carolina. Walking with God all the time through your life is transformative. And if you want to have an impact on the world right around you, there's no better way to do that than sharing Jesus with somebody. This group hasn't yet launched public worship. As they prepare to, they're temporarily worshiping in their pastor's living room. And he says to you today, I forgive you. They were sent to Durham from a Wells church about 20 miles away in Raleigh to explore planting a new church in this growing area. Because of what you have done, Lord, we have nothing to fear. <laughs> in order to do that, the group has been diligently trying to meet their neighbors and learn how to best reach them with the gospel. My son, who's seven, plays baseball. He plays Little League. And um, we made a very intentional decision to move him from the league that he had played in for three seasons to a league that's based in Durham. And, um, you know, for us, we live very close to communities in both Raleigh and Durham. And so we looked at the situation and we said, this will allow us the opportunity to um, be part of a Durham community and get to know people there better. And as a group, they have been volunteering with various nonprofit groups in Durham to meet the people that they are hoping to reach. We've just been trying to get into the city and just make those connections and just really get to know people in the area um, and, make, and try to make connections off of connections and just network that way to really just learn about the area and what's going to work here. As they come to understand the cultural makeup of their community and what its needs and concerns are, they are able to move into the practical steps necessary in order to launch their ministry publicly. So I would say we're moving along in kind of a logical, actionable sequence of, okay, now we need to have a space so that when we do go out and we invite people, where are we gonna invite them to come to? So, you know, we're starting to go through those steps and then there's just planning conversations happening um, and eventually that's gonna turn into more action. All of this work behind the scenes is happening with their neighbors in mind and how they can best serve the lost souls in Durham. We're just, by nature, we're not good listeners. By nature, we don't want to contextualize. We want them to understand us and, and hear what I'm saying and get into my shoes instead of, I want to walk a mile in yours. I want to understand what it's like to be a 20-year-old African-American growing up in Durham, North Carolina. Or I want to understand what it's like to be a 34-year-old tech woman who moved from Silicon Valley to here because they all got an interesting stories and they all got different perspectives so that when we start talking Jesus, we, we can hit them where, where they need to hear it. Despite being located in what's traditionally referred to as the Bible Belt, Pastor Lang says that 70% of the people in this area are not currently connected to a church. They're not hearing the good news of Jesus. They're not hearing about the hope that they can have. Maybe they just never heard it. Nobody ever told them. Um, but we have an opportunity to do that, to tell them ab about a Savior who loves them, a Savior who died for them. And if we can start to shine lights into the darkness, this place will become a place of light. We want to make decisions not based on the people who are here, but based on the people we're trying to reach for Christ. So in other words, what am I willing to give up? Am I willing to set aside my ego, my pride, my wants, my desires, the way I think a church should be run so that that person might know Jesus better and see their Savior? We ask the Holy Spirit to bless that and God will bless it as he wills and we trust that. All that we know is he told us to go and so we need to go. Wells hopes to plant many other home mission churches over the next 10 years much like this mission in Durham, that'll uniquely reach their neighbors with the life-saving message of the gospel of Christ. You can learn more about the 100 New Missions in 10 Years effort and how you can get involved at wells110.net.